Hi and welcome back to my channel. Today I am joined by my husband, Mr Purple, known here as Mr Purple, to talk to you about autism, ADHD and relationships, or in our case, marriage. So in the past I have made a video with Mr Purple, it was the first video that we made together and I try to remain incredibly positive about our relationship because there's a lot of negative information on the internet about being married to someone who is autistic or has ADHD, the sort of challenges of or how difficult it is or needing support with that and that doesn't feel very positive because relationships with any human can be complicated. Everyone comes with their own baggage and their own set of needs and just because I have a neurodivergent brain doesn't mean that any challenges that we have in our relationship are because of my brain or are my responsibility or my fault and Mr Purple is a perfect person. It's just not like that. But I recognise that there are some specific challenges associated with being in a marriage with someone who has a neurodivergent brain and I recognise that many people are searching for videos and advice on how to best handle those kinds of situations. So today we're going to get very real with you um, and we're going to talk about the specific challenges that we have faced as a result of my autism and my ADHD and the different way that my brain works from uh, Mr Purple's brain. So. I hope you appreciate us putting that out there for you and I hope that you find this video useful. Okay, so I'm going to start with the first and most obvious challenge that we face, which is the fact that because I am autistic and have ADHD, I have meltdowns. I have meltdowns for two different reasons. Because of my autism, I have meltdowns when my brain becomes overwhelmed by sensory stimuli, by emotions, by stressful things, sometimes even by fun things. And it all builds up and my brain decides it's had too much and I have a meltdown. I also have meltdowns because of my ADHD, because my brain is flooded by one big emotion and that becomes overwhelming and I have meltdowns and my meltdowns can be really difficult to deal with. I recognise that they're difficult for me to deal with, they're difficult for the people around me to deal with. I can be very loud, I can be very shouty, I can be very um, a lot. I'm just going to say it's a lot. It's a lot to deal with and I recognise that that can be a challenge for you. So the issue is that when I have meltdowns, if Mr Purple is around, he is exposed to that meltdown and, and probably feels some sense of responsibility to support me with that, which can be really difficult to do because I'm not in a place to be reasonable or rational. So over the years, let's start with talking about how it hasn't gone well and then finish by talking about the things that we've learned during that time and how much better it is now, really, to cope with. Okay. So meltdowns in the early days, how did that feel for you? Um, well, meltdowns in the early days were pre-diagnosis, so we, we had no clue as to what they, what was going on. Um, I always knew that you were a bit feisty, uh, and I thought that was perhaps just an extension of that. Um, I used to take it very personally that whatever it was that had made you become a lot um, was absolutely my fault and I'd done something horribly wrong and um, not knowing not knowing any difference between a meltdown and, a, and a, an argument that a couple have anyway it made it just feel like we were arguing all the time uh, and I was responding in a very negative very angry very very upset way yeah I feel like you would try to be calm initially and then like anybody you would reach your limit mm -hmm. and you would respond with anger mm -hmm. and it would become a very angry, volatile situation which would then make the meltdown last longer and increase the levels of guilt that I felt after the meltdown or in fact lead to more meltdown behaviour being like directed at you. Yeah, I think that was the, the um, fallout was after the meltdown had finished, uh, you, you tend to be... Uh, sensitive to more meltdowns in the, in the immediate day or days afterwards and if we were both walking around with this anger about things that had been said and done during the meltdown it just kept triggering other ones and, and then yeah they became difficult to, to handle. 
Yeah, so if you think of that in the context of, an, of, a, of a typical relationship where you get into arguments, there is a sensitivity in the few days after an argument for anyone, I feel. Um, and so because that sensitivity was in the air, that meant that it just became this, like we would have like a bad week or a bad fortnight. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. um, and that was really upsetting because what we really wanted to do was be close and be a team and be happy but we just didn't seem to quite be able to make that work mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. um and moving on to after the diagnosis so i was diagnosed uh in 2016 i think it was now uh so seven years ago and i think i initially thought on learning about meltdowns and on talking about meltdowns here on this channel and um to you a little bit i thought that that would mean that you would be like Oh, okay, I get it. Now it's all, it's just a meltdown and I can just deal with that. But what I hadn't taken into account there was that with the best will in the world, you still have feelings mm -hmm. <laughs> and also you still needed to learn what that meant. Yeah. So then, then followed a few years, I'm going to even go as far as maybe five years of meltdowns still happening and me feeling increasingly unsupported by you because you weren't responding the way that I wanted you to or it didn't feel like you understood that I wasn't choosing to do this? Uh, absolutely, yeah. I think it was a long, uh, difficult path to, to learning uh, how we've now got, got to a better place of dealing with, with um, meltdowns. Uh, so as I've talked about before, the, the difficulty of recognising the difference between what is a normal argument between a couple where we're just upset with each other and a meltdown where I'm the person that's right in front of you, I'm experiencing it, I'm being affected by it. And learning that the meltdown is a result of lots of things that have brought you to this point uh, and that you've just been triggered. And learning to listen in a, in a better way that's not taking it so personally, I think has been the biggest key for me. Being able to recognise what's going on and step away from it. And, and also stuff around like knowing what to do to support as well mm -hmm. and having like a clear plan and, and especially, and I think this was a really big problem, saying to me in a really supportive and loving way, what can I do to help you when you're in meltdown? And me in a rational state going, oh, well, this might help and this might help and that might help. And then you trying those things and them just completely not working. Not working yeah. And mm -hmm. me feeling bad because I wasn't able to give you a clear guide, but then actually looking back on that now, I'd only just found out I was autistic and I was only just learning about autism, let alone myself and my own stuff. So to be then expected, when I didn't know how to help myself, to tell someone else how to help me and in a clear way that would definitely work, it was a big ask. Yeah. And so then I think, as it would for anyone, you would try those things, they wouldn't work, and then that doesn't increase your confidence that you can handle the situation, so you would just feel a little bit powerless and helpless. Absolutely, yeah. So then, um, in the last couple of years, obviously things got more intense because we were in lockdown mm -hmm. for a while, and, um, and so we've spent, and also, Mr. Purple used to work more outside of the house and now works at home, so we're a lot more together a lot more of the time. Mm -hmm. And I have done some therapy and I have learned a lot more about what might help. And so I feel like we've made progress. But during that time, there was a lot of time where what we did didn't work. Um, um, and it felt like meltdowns were worse, not because of you specifically, but because for me, they were impacting someone else. It could have been anyone else, mm -hmm. but being someone who has meltdowns and then being someone who has meltdowns that impact someone else comes with an extra layer of guilt and upset and feeling unsupported. Yeah. So moving on to what's positive and what we have done, mm -hmm. I think one of the things that I've done that's most positive is to hold my hands up and go, I don't have the answers. Yeah. We have to learn together. I think combined with, we're not going to get it right every time. Sometimes it's just not going to work. Uh, but the times that it does work, we should take encouragement from. Yeah, exactly. That is something, uh, we did have a session with my therapist specifically on meltdowns mm -hmm. and one of the things that they said to us at the end of that session was give yourself permission to be imperfect and as you know if you've watched more of my videos I've really taken that on board so 
yeah, I think there can be this feeling when you're trying to tackle something like this, that when it doesn't go right, well, that's it then, that catastrophizing way of thinking, that's it then, we'll never get this right. Mm -hmm. Rather than, oh, it didn't go right this time, but it has gone right in the past and it will go right in the future and it's okay to not be perfect. Yeah. And it's okay to not be perfect in our relationship. Mm -hmm. Because I, the other reason I wanted to make this video is I would hate for people to look at us as an example of perfection mm -hmm. in a relationship. <laughs> There's no such thing. So, and, yeah. and people do have that idea that one of the things that's that's lucky for e for Ella is that she has this incredible supportive partner who always gets it right because that's what I've portrayed on camera because mm -hmm. because that's what you do for your partner. You boost them up and you don't talk about, in my opinion, you don't talk about the hard stuff. You talk about how great they are. And I just want you guys to not be sitting there thinking I'll never have that. It is a work in progress. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, what are the other thing, one of the things that we have found is uh, a few basic strategies that you can do when a meltdown looks like it's approaching that could prevent that meltdown from happening. And I think what's been important is that we've kept it simple. I think in the past I've gone, try this, try this, try this, try this. Now there are literally just two things to try. Yeah. <laughs> and we have them written on a piece of paper, pinned up on the wall. Before we go into it though, I'd like to just, just sort of say from my perspective that one of the things that's really helped is that not taking it personally, not so whatever it is that you're saying or doing, unless I know that I've done something really bad, it's not about me. And so I can take that slightly, um, what's the word, uh, objective viewpoint mm -hmm. where it, it's not to do with me, this is just about Ella and how I can help her. Uh, and therefore I'm able to think, right, so the strategy is I'm going to do this and we're going to do this. Yeah, and that's been and that's been really hard for you because of how much you love me. Mm -hmm. One thing that I'm definitely very secure in is that I know that Mr. Purple absolutely adores me, which is amazing, and I do feel lucky. And so to feel that there was something wrong with, wrong with our relationship was such a trigger for you. Yeah. And now you're able to see that it's not our relationship that's that's the problem. Yes. Yeah. So the two things that we do, and these will be very, very personal to you, and I would suggest you experiment with what calms you down and then try it in the moment, is uh, funny animal videos on YouTube has been reasonably successful. Yes. Yeah. Historically, I've always been amused by animals, whether they're real animals, cartoon animals, CGI animals, doing amusing things. So one of the things that I suggested and that we've used and that has worked is... Um, that Mr. Purple sit me down, put on YouTube on our TV and put on a funny animal video. And I do have to work a little bit. I do have to resist the urge to go, this isn't gonna work, this is stupid. Yeah, I was just gonna say that sometimes even when you're saying, no, no, I don't wanna do that, I still do it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because I'm not being rational and I'm not able to care for myself mm. in that moment. And I think it's been kind of fun because you've actually started doing funny animal video research and finding specific animals I might enjoy, right? So you found some otters yeah. that do cute things. What are the otters called? Uh, I can't remember the names. They're, um, I'll link yeah, in the description box to the otters because they are particularly good. Otters, mm. a pair of otters that live with some people and eat food. You can't beat it. So funny animal videos. Uh, and it usually only takes... What, 10, 15 Ten minutes? minutes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I'm kind of rational enough to take control of myself. And the other thing is, as regular viewers will know, I have developed a bit of an obsession with tea mm -hmm. in its many, many varieties. And I have bought some specific calming teas that have chamomile in them. And so to make me a pot of tea can be really helpful. Now, you haven't used this one specifically, but Roz was round here, I don't know, about six months ago. And I was having a meltdown and she was just completely ignoring me and she was just like tea I'm just gonna make tea and I was just like tea won't help tea won't work tea is terrible I hate tea she was just like I know that you don't so I'm just gonna make tea and she made a pot of tea and by the time we'd finished drinking this cup of tea I was okay again mm -hmm. so um, those are my things you will have your things but I would suggest they are things that don't require too much participation mm -hmm. and that you ignore the autistic person, this is never usually, ignore the autistic person, ignore the autistic person's, um, if they're saying this won't work, this won't help, but they've told you previously that it might, give it a go, see what happens. Mm -hmm. Would you say that's true? Yeah, absolutely. And then I think there's some important support needed after the meltdown, if it, if it actually happens, or 
or if it started to happen, or if I've said something unreasonable, if, or, or you know, essentially after a meltdown, or even after the beginnings of a meltdown, you are feeling very vulnerable, very exposed, and very silly, in my experience. Mm -hmm. And so, what would you say you do to support me with that? Generally not talk too much, uh, not try and ask you too many questions, be sensitive to the idea that you might it might be triggered into another meltdown if you're not careful, you know, if we're not careful as a family or, or the surroundings we're in. Uh, and generally, just make sure the world's a bit fluffy and nice for, you know, a day or so afterwards, just to be sure. Yeah, that really helps. It does. Um, and then I wanted to talk about, just briefly, when those things don't work or when we're not in a place to implement those things and I do have a meltdown, one of the things that we've been doing recently, which I'd say has worked, but I've asked for a tweak to it, is you've just stopped talking. Mm -hmm. And I would say it's worked in that meltdowns haven't progressed as much. Yeah. So it's, it's effective in that respect. But I said to you recently, one of the things that I do feel when that happens is, oh, he hates me and he's fed up with me because he stopped talking. So I've suggested that you just say, I'm okay, we're okay, but I'm gonna stop talking now. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that I've just got to the- clarify. Yeah. 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 yeah, so that I've got that information in my head and I don't have to worry about why you're doing that and whether you hate me. Mm -hmm. Which is obviously also connected to my own like trauma and rejection sensitivity. So that leads us quite nicely into that next topic. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, the other thing that can be quite difficult for any relationship like ours is that, firstly, anyone who has lived a life with autism and ADHD in this world, particularly undiagnosed till a later stage, is likely to be li living with some trauma responses, by which I mean things that have happened to them in the past because of not being accepted or understood because of our neurodivergence, that get triggered, that those same feelings get triggered by stuff that happens in the now. So to give you an example of that, I was very, very badly bullied in secondary school and rejected and I had very few friends. And so I now am very triggered if I feel that a group is doing something that would harm me or has said something that feels like a rejection. I'm really sensitive to that because it takes me straight back into that place that I was in as a teenager being isolated and bullied for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And another thing that's really strongly connected particularly with ADHD is a thing, it's not an official diagnostic term, it's just a descriptor called rejection sensitive dysphoria which is where we feel rejection or perceived rejection or criticism or perceived criticism very, very deeply and it's incredibly painful and any indication that I'm being rejected is likely to respond result in a really big emotional response from me. Mm -hmm. um, and that is an issue in our relationship in the following situations. If someone is not smiley and they just have a regular face, I read that as angry and annoyed with me. And actually no human can go around like this all the time. It'd just be painful, wouldn't it? You'd literally get a yeah. cheek injury, if mm -hmm. that's a thing. Uh, so that can be really tricky for you, yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. um, so let's focus on that one first of all, yeah. Okay, so I think um, it's been going on for a while that this idea that when you're a little bit upset you tend to assume that I'm annoyed or angry with you, when in fact I'm just being in my, in my natural relaxed face. Um, which I know sometimes can seem like I'm annoyed, but it's just my natural face, I can't help it. And yes, it's very difficult to be happy and smiley all the time, when, particularly when the person that you love is obviously struggling and having a very difficult time, to just be bouncy and happy all the time. That, that, that just, for me, is a very difficult thing to do. And it's an unreasonable expectation. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I don't want um, you to feel you have to do that. No. Uh, and I think just recently we've come to the conclusion that Again, like with the, the meltdowns, I just need to reassure you, okay, I'm going to stop talking, but uh, I will tell you if I am actually annoyed with you. And then don't assume that I am, assume that I'm not. Uh, and that's something that we're just working on at the moment, I think. Yeah, we, we just came up with this a couple of days ago, didn't we, mm -hmm. actually, that you said to me, because I said, oh, I'm just re I've started being able to say I'm reading you as angry, rather than you are angry, yeah. which I think mm -hmm. probably helps you to not 
react with defensiveness. Yeah. Um, because, you know, everyone has their own stuff and that's likely how you would react to that. Mm -hmm. um, and you said to me just a couple of days ago, look, if I am angry with you, I will tell you. Mm -hmm. So you, if you haven't been told that I'm angry with you, can assume that I am not angry with you. Yeah. And it also comes on from, <laughs> there have been times where you, 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 the more you keep telling me you look angry, you look angry, you look upset, you look upset, the more likely I am to become upset. And so it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, and so that, need, that, that you've worked on really hard at not doing recently, which has really helped. Um, it just left me feeling, am I, am I angry? Am I upset? Is there something going on? Should I be angry? Um, and when I, when I wasn't, I was just bumbling along, being myself and, you know... Being, well, I think anyone in that situation relaxed. being repeatedly told that they're angry would probably find that quite anger-inducing. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. I think on your side of that, because you are a, you know, a man in his 50s who was raised at a time when men were encouraged to not have feelings, you've had to learn so that this actually works to express when you aren't okay. Yeah. Because I think that mm -hmm. kind of came about in the past because you would say you were okay when you weren't because that's what a lot of men were taught to do. Yeah. But now that you do, ex you very regularly do express what's going on for you, mm -hmm. it means that I can believe you more. Yeah. So, so that was partly an autism thing and partly a, yeah, but you've said you're okay, but are you? Because you'd never tell me when you're not mm -hmm. kind of thing. Yeah. So it's like yeah. a combination thing. So, yeah. Um, we're not saying that that's going to work every time uh, and that, we've managed to find the perfect solution but we've certainly achieved a lot I think particularly in the last couple of years yeah and I think it depends where we're both at I mean all of this stuff comes with a big helping of if you're in a bad mood it's going to be harder for this stuff to work mm -hmm. if you're ticking along nicely it's more likely to run smoothly yeah and yeah. and as we said give yourself compassion for where it go where it goes wrong because mm -hmm. we we're not perfect people and relationships aren't perfect they're a lot of work um, I think the other way that this can be an issue is putting to one side your face. Um, you are a human being, and so every day you aren't sunshine and rainbows. Because <laughs> right. you have bad days at work, or you're tired, my... you haven't slept well. A lot on your mind sometimes, just things going around. And, and we're allowed to have different emotional ranges within the course of our lives and that's for me to expect you to just remain on this like particular level would again be an unreasonable expectation but I have found that difficult to not take personally mm -hmm. um, and, and living with someone I think this is very particular to a relationship because when you're in a friendship you can just not be around people when you're like that mm -hmm. but living with someone in, an, in, in a very intimate close relationship it's impossible to avoid that that natural mood fluctuation in each other um, but, but I think I take it very personally and I can feel like my world isn't right because I think that you're not okay with me and you can't reassure me because you're not okay because you've got your own stuff going on. Yeah. And so this is the, I think this is where it comes into that it can feel like as an autistic person, I just need this person to meet all my needs, but you can't expect someone else to meet all your needs. It's just not possible. Yeah. Um, so I'm learning to, rather than to say, what have I done? Why are you angry with me? I'm learning to say, what's going on for you and how can I help? Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I think that's important because I think dealing with all of this stuff that we've dealt with, it could end up feeling a little bit one-sided. And I don't want that. I want you to feel as supported by me as I want to feel by you. Mm -hmm. So this is a hard one to overcome. And I think there's another thing. A lot of late diagnosed autistic people like me have been in relationships for a long time. It's not an uncommon thing to have gotten married younger, to have gotten into a relationship young and not learned to cope without you. And I'm being really honest here, not learned to feel okay unless you're okay. You know, centering my emotions and my okayness around you isn't healthy. That's a, that's a big burden. That's a really heavy stone around your neck to be that responsible for something. Yeah, so I'm not doing that anymore. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Like, I can still be happy and okay when you're not happy and okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's work on both sides, really. It's about you learning to not close down and man cave and actually tell me what's going on as much as you can and actually ask for support as much as you need. Mm -hmm. And it's about me having the independence in myself that I can be okay on my own. Right, okay, so I think that this is a big video. So we're going to break it down into two parts. So this is part one, um, and I will, we will immediately film part two and I will put that up next week. So I hope you found what we've shared so far useful. I hope you appreciate 
Mr. Purple's candor here because this is not easy for him. Um, so do leave encouraging comments if you did find it helpful, why you found it helpful, so that we can feel that we're not just oversharing on the internet for no good reason. Um, if you enjoyed the video, do hit the like button. If you'd like to see next week's video and you don't want to miss it, don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Subscribe to my channel and uh, Yes, do that. And there are many ways that you can support me as a creator and they are all on my link tree, not least of which is joining my YouTube members club and then you can join my Discord group where we talk about all this kind of stuff as a community. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week. Goodbye.